Welcome to Salami Get This Straight, an Ibble exclusive. And today we are joined with none other than Abel Hernandez. He is a titan in the industry of food and cooking. And you're about to see why. I've got a little highlight reel for you here real quick. His restaurants include Eloise Chic Cuisine, Loretta Chic Bistro, and Margaret Chic Kitchen. Country of origin from Mexico, visiting us here today in Austin, Texas at the Ibble Studio. And you got a specialty in contemporary French, Franco-American cuisine, and you discovered from Mexican, an, Mediterranean. Look and at that. A bunch of restaurants. Of it's been great being in this industry. What do you not cook? I do not cook uh, Asian, Japanese. Oh, okay. Okay. Not that much. I really love it and yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. But I think it's, I don't know. I don't know. I, I probably kind of will need to go to Japan and learn <laughs> from first hand. Yeah. Probably to, to be sure of what I'm doing. Sure. No, I get that. The point is, though, you have a wide arsenal of, of talent and experience when it comes to cooking. There's so many places to start, but let's just start with this. What are you doing in Austin? What are you excited about? <laughs> Give us the yeah. background. All of that. What can I tell? I'm Abel Hernandez. Yep. I am the chef owner of a group called Culinaria Chic. We own a couple of concepts back in Mexico City. And I saw in San Miguel de Allende, which is a very nice town. Yeah. And my mother's Texan. I have family here in Texas. <laughs> Howdy. And it's been great coming to scout some things and places in Austin. Probably we can start a business over here. Yeah. I think it would be great. I, I love what's going on here in Austin. So I think it's a terrific chance and terrific timing after this pandemic and COVID that was yeah. hitting us really hard in Mexico. For sure. Worldwide, but Mexico City without the support of the government or without the support of another banks or whatever, with yeah. non-support, it was pretty hard to get through that. But when we came out, we saw that we were standing in this new part of our lives. And now my wife and I are stronger than ever. Oh, that's great. And making sure that probably we can follow and have a new chance of starting a new project here in Austin. Yeah. And you've done, you successfully started a handful, but let's get to the origin here. Where did the cooking bug come from? Oh, my mother is, has been always like a great cook. My okay. grandmother was a terrific cook. So it comes honestly uh, for you. Yeah. There's a tradition to family reunions and yeah. cooking and around and having these terrific tables around with the family or people you love and friends. And it's everything's around food. Yeah. Like if we travel and plan these uh, yearly trips with the family, it's always about where we're going to yeah. eat, how are we going to spend that. our time around the food and music and drinks. And my grandfather used to be a terrific yeah, foodie and used to drink these terrific wines. Mm. And suddenly life started just fixing and making yeah. things happen. Because when I started in high school, I had this girlfriend and we started making private dinners, like small things. Yeah. My mother used to help me cook in. And it's oh, like, we can awesome. handle that. And I started with my best friend since we were 14 years old, like no this way. events and making this DJ and sounds. And people just were asking like, oh, can you bring some burgers? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll bring some sure. burgers. Can yeah. you bring some tacos? Yeah, definitely, I'll bring some tacos. Mom, yeah. I need to bring tacos tomorrow <laughs> to a party and I'm, I'm making some money. Oh, great, I'll give you a hand. And we were always, but not conscious of what we were doing. My yeah. father used to run businesses, but he was, always commercializing items and yeah. bringing brands from the States to start selling in Mexico. And he, he always was pretty hardworking yeah. guy. And he showed us that. And yeah. and everything that we can start entrepreneuring, uh, he will always support us. Yeah. And, and I started in this college, Student Business Administration, and I was like, damn it, I don't like this that much. I yeah. But my father was also studying that. Right. And he did it whatever he liked. And I thought that, that was a way of probably doing whatever I like in, yeah. in the future. And then I met this girl and he, she was studying into chef school and culinary school and business administration for restaurant and yeah. hotels. I, everything that, that, that she told me, it was amazing. It was mm. like, ooh, sounds perfect. You have a wine class? Really? <laughs> sign like me you're up. you drinking in, in I college? I love the sound was, of that. Yes, I'm in. Yeah. And I was at that. I, bet I think I should change... Uh, mayor and i'm going to hotel business administration she goes no way i'm not wasting any more money on you if you don't work at least a year you know that you're going to be fond of it because otherwise i'm going to be spending more money on you he wanted to make like, a yeah. safe investment yeah so he sent me to work in a restaurant of a friend that it was like a 
Mexican bar restaurant. Yeah. And I was into the kitchen, like the lowest position in the kitchen. And it's yeah. like, just go and chop onions. You a week chopping onions. And it's, are you sure you like it? Yeah, I'm really fun of it. It's, I just learned bakery because the bakery chef just pulled me in and stopped doing that. Come on, I'll teach you some bread <laughs> stuff. And then I went to the hot part of the cuisine and in the other line and started learning and all the things. And I really love it and enjoy it. Uh, but there was more. It was like, I just don't want to only be in the kitchen. Yeah. I want to start my own business and yeah. I want to make some money. And we started this project that we thought it was amazing. But we were only 21 years old. And, yeah, just kids. And with no money, we opened a place with less than 10 Ks. Wow. And uh, it was an old place inside a cultural house that hosted people that were really interesting. A Russian feminist woman or an Egyptian really? girl. Or these guys. It was that, a melting pot. That, that you, it's, it was a refugee home for mm. artists. Yeah. from all over the world that were persecuted, not mm. only politically, but religiously or whatever. Yeah. So they were really nice experience, weirdo places. Like, Gives you some perspective for yeah, sure. Yeah, it gave us a lot of perspective. And we opened this business. We just work it hand by hand with my wife. And suddenly we nailed it. Yeah. It was like, after doing nothing, this guy just came to the restaurant and he was underdressed with his kid, her wife, they were just coming from the gym or something. Mm. And they were like, oh, I heard there, there's a menu for 250 pesos. That's under $15. And there's a four courses menu with two alcoholic beverages included. So it was pretty cheap. And what was in the menu was whatever we find out. It was the freshest and the coolest products cool. we could find. So it was terrific what we were doing. And these guys suddenly went down and said, dude, you know who I am? No idea, man. Clueless. And he was this critic from Chilango Magazine, no which way. is like Time Out in Mexico City, Just, uh, unassumingly. Yeah. And it, I really had an amazing lunch. It was, well, thank you. I'm going to write about it. Was, oh, I'll be pleased. There's no way he's doing it, right? <laughs> and a month from there, we were in this guy to the 50 best restaurants in Mexico City. The guys to look after for, right? Not in wow. the least of the 50 best, but he's yeah. a, you should Up look after coming. these guys because they're brand new and they're amazing. Yeah. And the next year, we were in the least of the 50, wow. like in the 20 seat. So it was a lot of people going into the place with the magazine printed yeah. because there were no apps. There was no cell phones or smartphones or whatever. And people just came in with the magazine and fucking got crowded. I love it. was it. like, oh, my God, what's going on? Yeah. It's, we don't have even more people. We <laughs> need to hire more people. And the first guy, he, the first guy we hired... Hilario, he was a guy that he didn't speak Spanish completely. He, he used to speak Nahuatl, which is a pre-Hispanic. And uh, suddenly he started making a lot of money. Dude, really, the barman, the head barman. <laughs> yeah, man. So we started uh, growing our people and, yeah. and hiring people that, that really thanked the opportunity that they have. Yeah. And we were thankful enough to share profits with everyone. It's, wow. Let's make this happen. Dude. It's like we did it from nowhere. And we started... And when we thought we were like in the top of the world, because after having nothing, having some, yeah. you feel it like, whoa, this is success. And uh, I started studying and making more specializing cuisine. I started traveling with a lot of other chefs. I was invited to, to exhibit shows, to serve dinners in yeah. top hotels in the world and cooking side to side with three Michelin star chefs wow. and you get to know a lot of things and tricks and it was like probably the best school ever. I was going to say, that's probably the way to learn. The way to learn yeah. because that's where like, you got Paco Roncero, yeah. three star chef from Spain. The like, big hitters. You put more water than that rice. Yeah. <laughs> sure chef. <laughs> it's like, what are you, you say saying? So. Yeah, sure, sure chef. This is, get, this is the guy, so, yeah. yeah. You have nothing to say to those. It's that's, like, that was like a straight Shut apprenticeship. Yeah. At a and, high level. And when they see that there's also a person that is thankful and uh, understand that he has to learn, mm -hmm. people are very given. Yeah. And that's where we started mixing. And we thought that if we were having this opportunity of growing, we needed to help people. And that's yeah. where we started also mixing with this social part yeah. and uh, people just came to the restaurant and said, dude, I have this project because we're helping this woman in Chiapas that, that they die around 40 years old because mm. they've been breathing 
CO2 from the heaters mm. and the, the stoves they use. It's steel wood stoves with no chimney to go outside the house. Oh, so man. the smoke came inside the room and they need to heat those rooms because it's pretty cold where they live. And uh, they die around 40 years old because oh, they've been breathing on this shit. So they are having these stoves sold for $500 which has this chimney, special, yeah. sustainable, and whatever. So we bought 100 for those, and we made this. And we started like that, and so many other associations just keep yeah. calling, and right. now that we do a lot of that. But that made us our way to get to know more people, and right. so people you know, really get to know our place. But there are funny stories around. For sure. It seems like I'm, I'm getting a theme here that your parents pass, your dad passed on the entrepreneur gene, your mom passed along like the, the, goods, love the love for food, but it seems like there was also a love for people that really yeah. came out of this. Like you have a very generous spirit. And I think that a attracts other generous spirited people like these Michelin star chefs that are coming along. And I think there's a, but there's also a, a community drive that feels like it was ingrained in you. And the point, like your kitchen, you're taking care of everyone in there, giving the opportunities. There's like a discipleship piece or an apprenticeship piece. And that's like a whole concept because the same way you think about the people, the mm. same way you think about your customers. Yeah. Because it's like sometimes chef went more important than the customer itself. Yeah. And we didn't think that. It's mm. like if this guy is coming and spending money in my restaurant, yeah. if he wants a sandwich, I'll fucking make him the best sandwich. Right, right, If right. he wants a burger, let's just make a burger. Yeah. And we started this second restaurant called Eloise, which was a French contemporary restaurant. Yeah, And we thought it. we were pretty famous. But we went, when we, went, we get there, it was like no one was coming through that door. Mm. It's a completely different neighborhood. It's, wow. Uh, it's a family neighborhood. It's, uh, it's a place where where people go out on weekends to Acapulco or Cuernavaca or Got other it. places that it's like like weekend second homes. Yeah. And and it was pretty hard. Damn it, I'm screwing everything because mm. what we did in the first, yeah. it's almost lost because I spent all the money Don't and I spent all my time here in this new project and suddenly people just started coming over and it's, oh, I just met this chef yesterday. Mm. We had a terrific food, probably not the best. It was just terrific. But having him here and getting to know his wife, mm. it's like my special place and I'll bring some friends tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, word of mouth, it took us almost two years. Wow. But it was damn crowded. Wow. Then it started to be like the best place. Your food started growing in quality. Totally. And then I made all the press to come. Yeah. And all the press, we started receiving a lot of awards, like really good awards in Mexico. And the food was just amazing. I started cooking with other chefs and making much better our food, yeah. our offer, our culinary concepts went better and more detailed. We, we started having money to do a lot of things. We started helping a lot. And, and after that, there was a chance to open a second in the same neighborhood. Cool. And we opened Loretta, which is a Mediterranean. And yeah. the, the, everybody asked, like, dude, why do you came up with a mm, French restaurant if you've never been in France? Well, I've been in France, but backpacking, like right, having right, some right. toasts in my sure. in my bag. Like eight McDo's budget for the for the whole day, so I yeah. didn't went for the foodie part. Yeah, we we went almost six years from having opened our French restaurant. Mm. I was with my wife. Dude, we gotta go to Paris because everybody tells Absolutely. me something about that. But I used to work with a lot of French chefs in my school. There was, was a generation yeah. that all those head chefs and culinary schools were from France. So it's a nice influence, and and it turned out perfect. Well, yeah. We got a French restaurant that includes the best burger in town. So uh, it's a place where you can just relax, chill, have fun, yeah. unpretentious, but still great food, great Love service. That. So it's a terrific spot. Is it safe to say you really highlighted creating an experience and the menu eventually matched? It seems like you really learned based on the community of the restaurant. It's based in the community. Yeah. Not the restaurants. It's, it's about people. Yeah. And understanding what the people has. Right. It's like when I got here, it's a, an investor that was thinking about this place called Mescal. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for a place to open Mescal. Yeah. But no, you first got to find a place and then know about the community around. Yeah, that's and good. what are you offering? That's good. What the community needs. Right. It's a business. Right. So you got to make people mm -hmm. comfortable with the place and feel it 
like a neighborhood place too. Yeah. So when you have that kind of belonging, probably you have a place for a lot of time. Totally. It goes through times and that helps a lot because your business plan doesn't release in a two year boom. Like That's good. That's a good per- point. It's not going to be an overnight situation. Concept just yeah. because it's trendy. No. Yeah. It's because it's a nice place where I can go and I know I'm going to have a great right. food for dinner. I admire the humility that y- you have, like this adaptability. Like I have an idea of what I think is going to work, but you really do. Your customers help you inform what the menu needs to be and what's going to become. And that's a fun process. It's because they're friends. Yeah. It, dude, I'm in your restaurant. Do you yeah. think I'm really craving for this sandwich? <laughs> Definitely, man. I have I'll perfect brioche. I have cheese. Yeah. I have proteins. Yeah. I can do you a sandwich. What what have been some of the cooler accidents? I, I don't want to say accidents, but like you weren't expecting to realize you can make this dish so well. But after, yeah, I'll try it out. What was one that like turned out to be a huge success? One of the f- most famous dishes was a mistake for my wife. Really? Yeah, it was a. It's a right now. It's a foie gras creme brulee that comes with a salad, yeah. with a vinaigrette of passion fruit, and with some raisins hydrated and Sounds white delicious. wine, and these crudons where you spread that thing. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Wow. The thing is, we were trying to make a royale or a flan, huh. and uh, it turned out it was too creamy for a flan. Huh. So, it, oh, it's a nice texture. Oh, we tried it. Oh, my God, it's amazing. Let's put sh- some sugar on top. Just burn it. <laughs> oh, there's a creme brulee. Perfect. Let's try to sell that. Wow. Everybody was like, even if I don't like foie gras, yeah. it's like this cream is amazing. Oh, I want to try it. It's awesome. So it's yeah. like, just spread. So people just come, oh, it's foie gras, and they try to make this, like, a very thin layer of foie gras because they want to share with all. Yeah. Just, no, just go ahead and grab a bunch. It's like, yeah, yeah. I'm water. I'm mouth I know. I am too over here. You're and, making uh, me hungry. <laughs> and that was just a terrific mistake. Another is this, we started trying to make some huevos rotos. Oh. Huevos rotos is a Spanish kind of potatoes with a yeah. fried egg on top. Sounds And then great. they just break it over with some prosciutto or I'm chistorra. Or Say no more. Whatever. I'm here yeah. for it. And everybody started cooking them and overcooked the eggs. If you had said that joke, it won't make the effect of having yeah. everything wet with this yeah. creamy sauce, right? Yeah. So it's too too overcooked always. And it's, man, come on. You can't do this. If it's too hard for you, you scramble some eggs raw and throw it in your fries or potatoes, <laughs> and that's it. You will get a better eggs than yours. That sounds great. And he did it like that. And I was like, oh, oh my God, let's try this better. And so I started doing this vein Marie eggs with some ha- habugo, this cured ham yeah. from this very region, of, very little region in Spain, which is amazing. Yeah. And I put some fresh truffles in them and chives wow. and just came to the table. They opened this dish and this, man, magic. That's a game changer. And when you start eating it, it's like having potatoes carbonara style, yeah. but it's amazing. Yeah, I want that for breakfast. Like Definitely. That, oh, my gosh. And so people started feeling that there are some French tendencies because we're making this risotto. I was like, how can we do escargots, right? Yeah. And it's like all the way escargots always has garlic, herbs, butter. Yeah. And the best part of eating escargots is having some nice bread. Yeah, just to, to dip into the butter and having this last yeah. bite with this girl. I was like, there's no other way to change it. How yeah. can we make it a little bit chicer, like mm. more trendy or more nicer presentation? And suddenly a risotto came over and we put all the herbs into the rice and then just put some scargos on top with the butter, with the garlic oh, and some crispy Parmesan chips on top. And everybody was just dipping the Parmesan chips and eating it. Oh, yes. Damn, it's the best risotto. Yeah. Instead of the bread, you have the rice, yeah. all the butter kept in there, and you have a perfect oh. bite, right? Kind of, kind of keeps it together a little bit easier, too. Yeah. And it's, wow, this is terrific because it's not a boring French yeah. restaurant. This right. is a, This is a nice you and trendy restaurant, and everything I try is really melts in your mouth. It's fat. Yeah. It's delicious. Yeah. It's, it's tasty. It's flavorful. Wow. And that's what we like doing, that people... Every time they get something to their mouth, they get to close their eyes and think a little bit and takes mm. you somewhere. And that's where you say, I'm nailing it. Yeah. How? Oh, gosh. I'm going to wipe the drool off my chin here. <laughs> yeah. How much in the kitchen do you feel is art versus science? I think science, it's probably 90% of the work. But it mixes with nature. Sure. Really, the ingredient makes 50% of the way. Yeah. The other 50%, 80% of that 50%, I think it's just uh, science. Yeah. And the other 10 is creativity. But 
if you make science with nature, yeah, you will have results that everybody will say, wow. Mm. After that, it's your creation. Yeah. You make that a risotto or you make that a pudding or you make that a pie. If it's perfect, see what it, yeah, see what it like becomes. If you're making a puff pastry pie, yeah, you need the perfect puff pastry. That's right. it. You can put whatever is inside. Mm. If you're not putting too much flour, if you're putting flavor enough, fat enough, protein enough, vegetables enough, yeah, you fucking make the best pie. Right. And people doesn't need more than that. Right now, if they like trends are. We were growing from food porn to farm to table mm. to organic things to creativity to molecular stuff. Mm. And then you got all that, yeah. put it in a blender. That's the new trend. That's it. And yeah. sometimes turns out the most simple things, but perfectly done, perfectly executed, and yeah. perfectly seasoned. That's what people like. I, I, new absolutely. luxury is that. Hmm. What takes you to that trip you just had? Yeah. What takes you to the closest best taco you had? What it's takes good. you to the closest best paella you ever eaten? Yeah, that's where you gotta go because this rich guy that's traveled has his chef in a yacht in the Mediterranean and he's tried the best yeah. bocadones, right? Right. You do it like that totally to make him feel that and travel his mind to that place, and then you nailed it. Right. You're in. Because, dude, there's this guy that has this perfect toast hmm. with this, even if it's an avocado toast. I you really gotta make like it perfect. That. That's awesome. You really obviously deeply understand there's a story attached to every meal. Definitely. And that's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah. And that's what you gotta look for. Yeah. Because you can get into a onion soup. An onion soup is, is, is as simple, but it's the most complicated dish that everybody likes because everybody has an onion soup in his head. Right. Some it's chicken broth, another it's beef broth, yeah. another is my mother make it with sweet cherry mm. uh, finish at the end. Some put a lot of Gruyere cheese, another Emmental, another yeah. dozen like crouton under the cheese. Wow. So nailing it yeah. has to be very complicated to, so everybody likes it. But when they try her onion soup, it was like, oh, something happened. Yeah. It's not like my mom's, but I really enjoy it. Yeah. Thank you. You were talking, touching on something earlier, and I think I really agree. There's a, I'm pretty sure a comedian, Mike Berbiglia, has a similar sentiment, but I adopted it where if you go to a nice restaurant and see a seemingly simple menu item, always order that thing because if they're willing to put something so simple on the menu, they're not fucking around. And I feel like you've definitely perfected that too. It's like, all right. This is a high demand option. Unfortunately, there are places that are like chains, yeah, and whatever that that people doesn't take care of the same things as yeah. the owner probably thought about in the first place. That's a right? good point. Yeah, but still, as the simpler the menu is, you have to be more perfect in the techniques in yeah. in, in the arts and the in the science on it. Sure. But after years of trying a lot of things, like what happens to most of the chefs, and I'm talking about. Danny Avalu, Eric Grippe, sure. uh, Thomas Keller, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're growing older and it's, you understand that the simpler is the best. Yeah. Like, I don't need to put a lot of things on top of a burrata right. and a nice sourdough bread. Wow, that sounds it's great. Like, if you got a nice burrata yeah. and a sourdough bread, done. And the best olive oil, that's all you need, man. Simple. And some sea salt. That's yeah. it. Sounds you can great. put some pesto and you can do molecular things in it and you can put it. I think people whatever. are trying to do too much. But sometimes. it's like, man, you got the perfect burrata. I don't want nothing. I yeah. just want to cut it in four totally. and put it into my mouth. Right. That's it. That's what I like right now yeah. for a burrata. And that takes me to this part of Italy where I mm. was sitting in this part of the Toscana, having this in a garden with these beautiful tomatoes on the side oh, wow. and this beautiful basil. That's everything I need. What is it about food that transports you like that? Music does too, but Smell, food, yeah. The eyes and yeah. everything. Food makes the most realistic memory Re recreation and recreation of, of what you felt. That's because good. You got eyes, smell, yeah. and taste gathered together, Three making senses. one memory of it. That's a really good point. I never thought of it like that, but that absolutely makes sense. It's making stronger. So, yeah. Food can make you travel everywhere. Yeah. Wow. I love that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Jeez. Okay, you're blowing my mind right now, Abel. Let's talk about, is there maybe a niche or a genre that you've always wanted to explore that you just haven't had the chance to yet? I think, yeah, Mexican food 
was was something I, I, I never tried. Mm. And it's one of my favorite cuisines. Yeah. But Mexican food started turning into something I didn't like that much. When we started to to turn out famous in Mexico, everybody was doing like duck magre with mole mm. and some rare rare leaves from La Milpa or cornfields mm. that taste very powerful and strong. Mm. And dishes were like Chefs were forgetting about the fun part of Mexico mm. because Mexico is about sp spices and yeah. smokiness and, and colorful things yeah. and chorizo and sour cream yes. and avocado and salsa verde. And, and suddenly it turns, no, because there's this dish in the Sierra of Oaxaca. Yeah, but the Sierra of Oaxaca is pretty poor. Yeah. People don't have the most beautiful ingredients and they don't mm. have money to buy them. So it's a pretty poor cuisine yeah I, it's interesting to get to know that but it's not a top seller man it's right. like people is not coming back to your restaurant right. because you're selling that i know right. it's interesting i know that we 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 need to revalue some mm -hmm. dishes because it's interesting yeah. but it's not always fun maybe you're going for a little bit too much of the high brow when you need a little bit more of like the class it started happening a lot like all yeah. the cooks because sometimes they didn't went to chef school they did nothing so it's flavors they know and yeah. they think if they played it beautiful, they will have a beautiful dish. And yeah, it's a beautiful dish, but it's a non-flavorful dish. I don't <laughs> want to come for that tomorrow. And if you don't make people to remember what they're eating, how are they going to crave it the next, right. the day after? Yeah. It's Okay, I went to this beautiful restaurant and, oh, yeah. and we have beautiful food. Okay, what? I don't remember. Well, exactly. not good enough, man. Right. Not good enough. Yeah, I want to take get your take on this. I do feel like Austin's got a lot of great food scenes, but there's nothing that's more off putting for me. Like my wife, be like this restaurant is so cute. And we'll go and it like exactly you said, a very forgettable experience. I'm like, yeah, it was adorable, but I just I wasn't blown away by the food. Versus you go into a hole in the wall that's very unassuming, and your taste buds are just blasted. And you're like, this is it. That you remember. I yeah. think you're absolutely right. And and what's interesting is there are so many people looking for a nice bite yeah that just doing it correctly mm. and with good techniques you nail it yeah you're gonna be better than 80 percent of the places for sure and and that makes sense right now in austin because people are coming from all over the country just to work and meet yeah and it's amazing i think potentially there's a well. chance hopefully i'm yeah. really looking forward we find this terrific spot yeah and i think we can do some very cool considering like the two dozen dishes you just rolled off that all sound amazing i have no doubt you could totally come to this market and bring something is there a dish right now that's like that you just love you light up when you get to make it san miguel's been great because in in the half of the pandemics yeah. these guys that own a chain of hostels and hotels called selena they have 176 hostels around the world mm. from new york to mykonos madrid mexico yeah. cancun a lot of beaches so it's this vibe that mixes digital nomads hmm. and lgbt people mm -hmm. and all different walks of life everywhere from everywhere in the world gathers in a salina it's always fun it's always yeah. party and i thought it was perfect to make this new kind of mexican food that is really joyful playful I love that. and uh, and fun yeah. so we made this rooftop where you have the best side of San Miguel in front of the parroquia, which is mm. a beautiful monument in San Miguel de Allende. It's a, mm. one of the most beautiful towns in Mexico, and it's considered one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And uh, this place was like, what should I do? It's young people. It's a, they have in margaritas. Probably they mm. want guacamole. Okay, let's put this perfect crispy pork uh, oh, yeah. belly in top of this beautiful guacamole mix yeah. with tomatillos to rise the acidity and not only lemon and wow. lime, which is sometimes I don't like a lot in guacamole and just some perfect fried cheese. A lot of texture going And then in that make block. this taco mm. with octopus and chicharron prensado, uh. which is beautiful. So it makes a perfect yeah. bite. And we, we make this barbacoa of picanha uh. cooked into maguey leaves, agave leaves, wow. and some beer. It makes this beautiful kind of beer or that barbacoa. That sounds perfect. And uh, those are bites that you really get a bite of that yeah. sope and you will remember it for totally. a couple of years. Totally. You're like a you're like a conductor. Like you're like leading the orchestra, but like it's just food is your canvas there. It's really I love watching how your brain 
works. There's other chefs that probably think that I don't cook that much, and probably I don't. After having Can six or seven restaurants running, huh. it, you can't cook in one. It's like you had to be checking out everything, and you yeah. had to mix in accountability and PR and marketing, mm. and you have to mix with the guys in the server, and you had to choose wines for the, the whole restaurants. Yeah. But what we do is creating new concepts and concepts that we make sure that the chefs that run each yeah. concept and the managers that runs each restaurant share our way of thinking. I love that. That they, too, have that enthusiasm, that excitement, they that They have to do it. The passion. Like, okay, you're going, well, dude, but I don't, don't right. eat dairy. I don't eat gluten. I don't eat meat. Yeah. Dude, don't worry, man. What do you feel like having? I feel like having cheese with All right, There we go. Perfect. We you got, got you. It. That's man. That is a refreshing adaptability. I maybe this is unfair. I have a stereotype of chefs that are very controlling over their menu, want to do what they yeah. want to do. But when did that happen? And change right. because restaurant. It's a world that comes from yeah. rest. We call it in Spanish restaurando, mm -hmm. uh, restoring. Oh. Restaurant world comes from restoring, and people used to come to these places to restore yeah. because. They were short in energy because they came from a crusade I or like, they came yeah. to a place because they were traveling from one country to another mm -hmm. in horse riding. And th there's where the restaurant world was written. And now it's a favor. The chef is doing me a favor for receiving me yeah. or the chef is doing me a favor. Oh, I'm sorry. Chef doesn't uh, like Parmesan cheese to be spilling the risotto. I don't give a shit. I'm the yeah. customer, man. Why the chef doesn't like me to put <laughs> cheese on my dish? Well, take this yeah. dish back to the chef and tell him it's your, it's his. Yeah. Bring mine with a lot of cheese, please. Right. No, I, okay. I didn't even know that, but that makes total sense. It is. It, don't you it, think it, it inspires it's like, your philosophy? Why am I going to have right. only what chef I'm paying for it? Can you put the shishito yeah. peppers on the side? That, I, I like that a lot. And I, I, it feels though you. Will na like are naturally attracting similar people. Like, yeah, let's. What can we do to create a better experience for a customer? Well, you gotta listen to your customer. Yeah, audience is the first thing you have to listen. Yeah, and and people think that it's like, chef, you're only controlling the kitchen, but money comes from outside, from the people, and you gotta That's be good. outside talking to them, explain them That's why good. do you get that dish, how do, do you think about yeah. that, why you're doing this, and be kind. Yeah, it's like. That makes people like oh, loyal bet. to your place. Like, totally. I gotta come back to that place because I'm I I'm heard care over of. there. Yeah. I'm, I'm heard over there. Yeah. In in other places, it's they don't give a damn. Right. No. I from the thirty minutes we've been chatting, I absolutely see that. Like, I can imagine coming to your place is a very hospitable, very welcoming time. Where we've talked a lot about where you find inspiration. Can you give me an example of a time where you, it was the most random place that inspired a dish? Like you never would have expected. And we've talked about accidents, but was there a time like you were having a conversation with someone like, yeah, let's make that. Loretta was a, an inspiring place. It was like, yeah. really, we had a lot of success in LOEs and we were like, let's do whatever we want. Yeah. And we had. How freeing that must be. My partner in that project was Eduardo Morali, which was probably best chef in Mexico. Uh -huh. And he's now running one of the most important groups, 50 best worldwide and whatever. He's a go-getter. And yeah, Eduardo is probably the best chef. And we had two years hand-to-hand -hand in the same office. I, I used to have this big office in, in, in the top part of the restaurant. Mm. And he was like, we're partnering. I want a desk beside yours. He's like, yeah, come on, put your desk over here. And we had this whiteboard and we had two years of making the best menu ever really? because you had two years to plan it because we were short in investment because of a bad decision we took. Mm. So we almost extended the refurbishing of the place two years. Mm. And in those two years, we really get to the best menu. Wow. We were like, what do you want? Okay, we want this, mm. for example. We have these dates stuffed with, how do you call it? It's kind of chorizos but it's from another part of Orasada. and then we just wrap it with bacon and put some balsamic vinegar aged for 15 years That's on top great. and some chives and we tried and it was like really awesome and it was let me try that with a sip of the mezcal let's make that like the olives in a martini let's yeah. put that in the mezcal so everybody has a shot of mezcal and then has his date That's it's brilliant. amazing or we were doing like well we need to do this I want this green fish just grilled in this charcoal ovens like 
very high temperature ones. And we made this perfect sea bass that we got from Ensenada from a farm. That it's it's a street bass, but it's from a wild clone. It's probably the best fish I've ever tried. Wow. And we made this grilled dish with some broccolis, with a praline of almonds and some white raisins. And the bite is really awesome. Mm. And we make this moussaka because I really love moussaka. And we make some things and and make this thing that really you can just see all the cheese melting yeah. and this perfect creamy bechamel. And then you have the stew of lamb and the eggplants in the wow. in the shells. It's really amazing. It's a bite that you say, I would like to have that in the cinema <laughs> with a with this yeah. big spoon and I could be eating that for the rest of the day. Yeah. And uh so there are a bunch of possibilities. Yeah. That it was just a restaurant thinking and what we like to have. Yeah. Like in five different yeah, it was awesome. It's a terrific project and we're still building new things and new dishes that everything is i remember this place from austin yeah. and we love this dish from loro and yeah. now we have a so kind good. of thing like that in loretta it's like yeah love that. great awesome but you got to travel you got to know you gotta great get some spots points because otherwise it's not only where you study it is who you cook with and after that, that it's where you try that thing because yeah. how do you get to make the perfect dogma gray Right. If you never try a perfect done Doug McGray, hmm. who does it perfect? Thomas Keller definitely does it. And I was like, okay, you got to go and visit French Laundry. This, yeah. And then you have to visit, per se, in New York. Hmm. Oh, okay. I know how to make perfect. Data points at that that, that point. Well, that's a perfect. Yeah. I'm not sure if I want to make it as good as him. Got but it. now you have to aim. Sure. And then experience and then time yeah. will make you get to there. Wow. I like that. I I admire that you're a lifelong learner. It'd be easy for someone like you to have the success that you've had to easily just fill it in. Like, I've carved my empire, but you're still looking. And yeah, I, I and love learning. That. And learning, yeah. because that's the most amazing part totally. of it. It's like, now this new experience is probably coming to America and Texas. Exciting. It's yeah. Like, this two years is like, wow, it's, it's great. Adventure. It's great. This is adventure, getting to know another community. Yeah. Because what life takes you, and you, you just open in different neighborhoods, you get to know a lot of people. Totally. And, and it's amazing. That's the most grateful thing that this business has. Yeah. The people you get to know. It's like amazing stories, amazing people. Yeah. I, I turn out to be friend of old people, families together yeah. that you know them, everyone that calls you, oh, it's my, it's going to be my dad's birthday. Can you make wow. it to our home? That's and so can cool. you bring something sober? Yeah, definitely. Don't worry. And you get invited and you get to try the best wines because yeah. these guys open some bottle of Petrus. Jeff, please <laughs> have a glass with me. Oh, really? Yeah, thank you, man. <laughs> and and I've tried and I worked and I played and it's been a terrific journey. Yeah. Like pretty thankful for life you, bringing us here. Chef are are very much probably uh, I think spiritually a mayor of communities in a lot of ways that you're bringing folks together and that's that's the power of of food and that's the power of cooking, especially again going back your mother instilled love and your dad instilled that entrepreneurial drive and clearly you are the best of both worlds there. Yeah. And that's something to be proud of. And my daughter, my father-in-law and my wife and everyone has been so supportive. Yeah. And in order that we have a nice, organized, legal, and well-being business. Yeah. Because also helping the community gives you a love lot it. back. I love it. Yeah, I, I can imagine people are taking care of you because you're taking care of them. Yeah. It's a, you know, there's a lot of reciprocal nature there. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, Chef, you really are very inspiring. And I love your, I love your, your zeal for life and food, it's, it, it is contagious. And I, I hope you do come here to Austin and I'm I very excited to, to, yeah. to experience that because you've got my mouth watering. I'm dripping over this mic here. And it's uh, great meeting you. It's also great. Oh, thanks, Chef. Abel Hernandez, just a fantastic guy all around. I could talk to you for another hour, but I want to be respectful of your time. No, uh, perfect. Thank you so much for joining us here at Abel and I hope to connect with it's you It's great to know Abel. I think I'm yeah. going to find a lot of people, cool people who could get to know through the platform. We have you. We have a good start. I, I can tell you that thank much. Thank you for making Thanks for being possible. here, Chef. I appreciate you. Thanks for uh, listening to Salami Get This Straight with Chef Abel Hernandez and your old pal Sean.